Hello, friends on the YouTube channel. We are resurrecting these Zoom chats, and I'm so thrilled to be speaking to someone who I've admired for many, many years, someone who's been gracious enough to not only have me on the radio, but play some of my goofy songs. But enough about me. This is about my guest. Please welcome a very familiar face and especially voice, especially if you play some video games. We'll talk about that in a second. Please welcome James Sabalski. Welcome, James. Wait a minute. Using resurrect, does that make me Lazarus on this episode? <laughs> Well, I, no, I wasn't suggesting as much. Let's just talk about the joy that he's comes alive. From he's yes. alive. I'm you are kidding. alive. Yeah. You are alive. Yes. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, man. How are yeah. you? You look well. Uh, thank you. I, I, my wife and I are doing a bit more fitness and trying to uh, just be healthier in all areas of our life. And it's, it's been working, but thank you for noticing. And uh, you look good. What's, what's the outfit? What's the, what's the gear? This is, uh, you know, what am I wearing? Uh, well, this is, uh, this is an old uh, Ottawa Lynx AAA uh, baseball team. Uh, they were the minor league affiliate of the Montreal Expos way back ah. in the day. And I worked at the ballpark in Ottawa when I was a teenager, selling hot dogs and uh, working the grill and selling uh, sport bottle drinks. And um, I was in Chicago a couple of years ago for my first ever uh, Bears game at Soldier Field and nice. kind of walking through uh, Chicago one day and I stumbled across this store that had this hat and I was like, oh my God, I need this hat because the team is no longer. So um, I feel like there's a history in cities that I've worked in. There's a lot of teams that have kind of gone by the wayside when you... <laughs> Look at, uh, I mean, the Grizzlies <laughs> and the Voodoo. But not, not because of you, though, Rough James. Riders. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I do wonder, was it me? That I, am I the jinx around here? And then this is just an old, uh, I got this at a thrift shop um, yeah. a few years ago. I'm not, a, I'm not really a thrift shopper, but I was looking yeah. for a Halloween costume, and I saw this, and I was like, man, I need this. But it's just an old, it's an Adidas zip-up or with, with Cape Town on it. It was so, good. There you go. Uh, but I like the are color. Like, are you? But I, man, it's amazing how many people want to talk about this thing that I think I paid maybe eight bucks for. So <laughs> it looks good. Better than cool. this. I'll stuffy, take it as a win. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got this stuffy dress shirt on. So no, you look better. You look hey, really you're good. You're all corporate on me, Clay. You yeah, sold out. I, I know. I couldn't get home in time. Okay. So but that's okay. Just don't tell my boss. So okay. uh, many of you recognize, many people will recognize you, uh, voice and face, uh, sorry, face and voice of not only Sportsnet 650 recently, now doing Abs for Canucks, now doing NHL, the EA Sports franchise. We'll get into all of that. But can James, can you give us a quick uh, background, maybe a bit about your family, whatever you want to share? And, and what, and basically, not only that, but I also want to know, uh, maybe, I don't want to rush you, but quickly, kind of all the stops that you've had in your, in your broadcasting career, because I think it's, it's really a cool story, truly, truly, truly. Uh, you, got, you got three hours for this? Yeah, let's go, let's go. No, I, you know what? I would say, uh, okay, first things first, from a family standpoint, yes. um, I am a very proud dad. Um, we are a blended family, my, mm. my better half, Brenda, and I, who is the ultimate boss lady, and yes. she is a neuroscientist, and um oversees a very big team of really smart people and she's just amazing and just awesome. hor horrible taste in men which obviously <laughs> i know the uh, feeling this guy yeah um but <laughs> you know that being said we're a blended family uh we have between the the two of us we've got four daughters um, wow 13 10 10 and six and awesome so it's a busy household, and then we have our uh, year and a half old puppy Odin, uh, who's an Entlebuker Mountain dog. So most people, despite the fact that they may say, "Oh, I love dogs," they've never heard of an Entlebuker, but he's part of the Swiss <laughs> Mountain Dog family. So uh, kind of the same coloring of a burner, uh, but kind of about the height of a beagle. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's uh, that's our household, and yeah, everybody's pretty busy and active, and uh, we have a lot of fun together and. It's a noisy household, but it's one that that's how we kind of roll. And, um, wow. the, and the four girls, that makes sense because I, I remember hearing you doing voiceovers about vans, needing a van for your family and stuff. Now that makes sense. If there's six of you plus the dog. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no, we don't, we don't travel light. Like we are, we were immediately like pushing the limits of uh, COVID restrictions for mass gatherings uh, <laughs> when they were first put into place. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're here in, uh, we live in Delta and nice. uh, in South Delta specifically. And you know, we, uh, for me, I grew up uh, in Ottawa originally in mm. uh, the nation's capital and, you know, always had a, a love for broadcasting. I think it was what I wanted to do from the get go. And um, along the way in high school, I had done community television mm. and just wanted to be a play by play guy at, at no, 
all possible avenues. And so I just did anything I could to get my reps um, doing play by play. And, you know, in those days I did boy, minor hockey. I did <laughs> karate tournaments. I called ring at championships. I did university basketball, university football, um, wow. just uh, touch football t- uh, tournaments as well. And, and then was lucky enough uh, to do play-by-play for the Ontario Hockey League's Ottawa 67s. And, you know, that was a real experience for me. Obviously, I was going to, to school as well in, in college and at Algonquin and uh, taking radio broadcasting. But I learned under a guy who, you know, is <laughs> kind of the definition of old school in some respects. But uh, Brian Kilray, who's in the Hockey Hall of Fame, and mm. he is the uh, winningest junior coach in uh hockey history and brian uh, had won memorial cups and um he was uh, i guess probably for a long time was known for a lot of people to be like don cherry's best friend uh, but but you know killer had he was kind of uh, the unofficial mayor of the city of ottawa commanded a ton of respect and um yeah he was he was a great way to learn i mean there's things that he did that you wouldn't be able to probably do now you know where you know (laughs) players drinking on the back of the bus and you know the radio guys would sometimes have to buy a case of beer to provide you know for the veteran players that were you know kind of the 18 well the 19 and 20 year olds but i think there'd be some 18 year olds that would have a few as well and you know, uh, you know, oh my God, like everybody on the coaching staff or, you know, the management team, everybody either had a cigar or a smoke in their mouth. And this is on a bus with Tita, right? This is the mid nineties. Um, and, you know, <laughs> just thinking like the ventilation, just, oh my God, like these are all kids. These are, you know, athletes. <laughs> and uh, so I, it, but it was, it was a good way to learn because there was an accountability that, you know, I think if you were talked to, in today's day and age, you would get in a lot of trouble for, mm. you know, for being considered a bully, um, sure. for being considered, um, you know, just too boorish and that just inappropriate. But, you know, Killer was so respectful to women in the workplace. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, but I, I think in some respects, you'd almost construe it maybe as, as patronizing in some ways where, right. you know, if a woman went into the room and, you know, he'd kind of yell out like, guys, you know, you know, there's a woman coming into the room. And so guys knew to towel up and it was more about being respectful as opposed to gentlemen. But, but also I think for two ways. Right. And, you know, and some, I mean, some, you know, guys don't, some men could be embarrassed and I think some women could feel uncomfortable, but nevertheless, I mean, he, he, he did that. And, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he would, uh, but if I asked a stupid question, I mean, he'd call me on it. Right. I mean, he, (laughs) I'll, I'll, I, there's a story that James Duthie wrote a book about Brian Kilray years ago, uh, a few years ago anyway, um, and I had, I had shared the anecdote in, in the book about how I was public address announcer for about half a season before I started uh, working at the score and moved to Toronto, but I was, uh, I was public address announcer one night, and uh, it was about 7-2 late in the third period, Ottawa leading Oshawa at the Ottawa Civic Center. And the 50-50 number came up and I, we announced the winner. And it was a guy who was from Oshawa. And so uh, I was like, hey, congratulations to Clay Emu from <laughs> Oshawa and the crowd. Like there's probably 7,000 fans in the building that afternoon. And a boo, and to which I kind of... Hey, well, they got to win something, right? And, uh, <laughs> hey! and, and you know, it's kind of the power that you have on the microphone. And yes. um, so, you know, the crowd kind of laughed and, you know, I thought nothing of it. And I, I got downstairs after the game uh, to go collect my 40 bucks. And, um, and I just remember Brian Campbell, uh, former NHLer, and yeah. uh, Dick Boynton, another former All Star defenseman, yeah. as well. Uh, the two of them were walking out of the 67th room at the same time, and they both kind of look at me and they're like, "Oh, did Killer see you yet?" And I'm like, "No, why?" He's like, oh, he's like "Yeah, see you." <laughs> and I'm like, "What?" And I, I come around the corner, and he, you know, Killer just tore into me like, "You shut the front door." you don't you know and just screaming at me you idiot and just but the point was they already want to kick our ass we yeah. don't need to give them another reason like you <laughs> to want to kick our ass even more so shut the hell up and and kind of blasted me 
and gave it to me pretty good for about 90 seconds. And then afterwards, uh, just kind of, all right, now shut up and have a beer and kind of, yeah. and then kind of smirked. But it was teaching respect yes. that, you know, be, be humble, like be modest in, in victory. And I, I, there are so many things that I look at from what I learned from Brian Kilray. I mean, he terrified me. I, I, mm. I the first time I, I, inter I interviewed him, I nearly, and I say this literally, I almost crapped my pants. I was so scared. Um, but he taught me respect and, you know, I think killers now 87 or so. Wow. And, uh, man, he's just a remarkable guy. And wow. I, I just, uh, you know, with what I learned on the journey and I think he really shaped a, a lot of young men along the way that, yeah. that went on to play and have wonderful careers in the national hockey league. But, um, you know, he, he was, he was a great, um, he was a great learning resource for yes. me because of just everything. It, it just accountability, mm -hmm. respect yep. so much that, you know, again, an attitude or a personality that probably wouldn't hold up well in a 2021 society, but at a time where there was still kind of the old school hockey and I, you know, when people hear that now, there's, there's an element of, oh, you know, uh, I don't want to hear that. And especially, look, I mean, there's some serious problems that we've just seen in the last couple of weeks that mm -hmm. there are some real bad things about old school hockey, yeah. but, but traditional values that don't necessarily translate from a hockey standpoint, but more so just about just being respectful, respect your elders, respect other people, be nice. Um, you know, I mean, you know, get a, get a kick in the ass if you're out of line. I mean, yeah. killer kind of had that sort of, that sort of tough love and, you know, it was, it never felt personal. It was just, uh, but it was kind of, it was, it came out of a place of love. Love that story, James, because no matter if you're in media or in church, church work or education or cert, whatever it is, we all need mentors. We all need mentors in our lives and that they are the ones who pave the way. They're the ones who teach us what we should be doing and what, how should we should be acting, what we should be saying. So uh, as, as someone who mentors young people, I have my own teenage kids, as you know, and, and work in the, in church circles. I love that story. And I, I think uh, sometimes we, we get afraid because yeah, we're going to cancel or say the wrong thing or whatever, but yeah. when, when it's genuine and where there's an authenticity there, then there's nothing better. And I, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. no, thanks. And it was yeah. neat because the last World Junior Hockey Championship that I covered uh, in 2009, um, yeah. it was in Ottawa. Everything had kind of come full circle for me. My, you know, my, my first daughter was born. And to go back to Ottawa and, you know, I had a chance to interview Brian kind of, mm. you know, just in the stands as a sideline reporter uh, for TSN at the time. And, and man, like that moment meant so much that there was a poster that was being passed out to fans that killer was being recognized. And I think it was just, thank you for, you know, all the wins. And it was a kind of a congratulatory thing. And, and I had him sign it. Uh, and I, and I actually got it, you know, kind of laminated, um, you know, with a plaque kind of plaque uh, in the back. And I, it's just something I've always kind of kept as a, a nice little, uh, just a footnote that just meant so much to my time that really kind of shaped me because look, I've had people yell at me before players, athletes, coaches, <laughs> uh, you know, managers, uh, along the way, uh, yeah. executives, but, you know, just learning, you know, under the Brian Kilray learning tree, if you will, was a, was a great experience. Love it. Now, somehow then, James, get me from, was that late 90s or early 2000s? When yeah, that in, was, okay. uh, yeah. So, I mean, covering the 67s was kind of yeah. 94 to okay. through to 98, uh, off and on like, through school, uh, I did. And then uh, mm -hmm. I had done some stuff with community television. And then I did a little bit of, when I was working in radio as well. And yeah. a little while and um and landed the public address announcer job as uh for the team mm -hmm. uh and then in uh, the fall of 98 uh had an opportunity to move to toronto uh mm -hmm. and take a job with headline sports the score yes yes the sc um, that's right that's and, right yeah and put in uh i guess a little over seven eight years there and worked in toronto for the first uh two years 
and had an opportunity. I had, I had said to them once, I said, um, well, if you guys ever need somebody in Vancouver, I'm your guy. And they're like, <laughs> oh, are you from there? I'm like, no, no, but I'd love to go. Uh, and I just remember as a kid, just always seeing images without snow. And I was like, man, I want to go there. <laughs> as somebody who had done a lot of minus 30 winters and shoveled way too many driveways, <laughs> like man i need to go there <laughs> and uh and what do you know out of the blue um in uh, about a year and a half onto the job or so they said uh, hey remember you said you'd be interested in going to vancouver I'm like, yeah. well you want to go I'm like, wow what? and so they transferred me out there in the late summer of 2000 yep which was a perfect time it, you know it was well it was a, it was a fun, it was a perfect time in a lot of ways for me because um you know, I was, uh, I was still probably somewhat immature. And hmm. so it really kind of forced me to put my big boy pants on, <laughs> but it was, it was from a professional standpoint, I got there and the lions had just kind of figured things out and went on a run and won the gray cup that year. It was Lucas hmm. Aglia's final yes. year. So Damon Allen and Lou, yes. the Boot and, you know, Alfred Jackson and Steve Barato was their head coach and you know, that was kind of a fun run uh, that kind of, you know, just kind of caught there just in time. And, mm -hmm. and the Canucks at the time had just turned the page with the era of, they had said goodbye to Pavel. They had, you know, that's right. Late 90s. Yes. The, yeah. The Messier, and so, the Messier and Keenan. And, yes. And yeah. Messier, Messier had just left as a free agent. So the yes. Messier era was over. And, and so they were at a, a time where they were going in a new direction with a, a youth movement and it was, okay, well, who's going to be the captain? So it was Nazi. It was Bird. It was Adrian Coin, It was Jovo. It was, you know, Felix Potvin was there as their goal, yeah. you know, and, and, and Daniel and Henrik were rookies. Um, yes. And so I covered the Canucks for four years, but that first year uh, in Vancouver was, it was a lot of fun. There was so much going on. And then the Grizzlies, um, yes. they, ultimately, they, they left town. Like this was all in the first year. Actually on top of that was the McSorley trial in the first six weeks that I was in town as well. So my first year in Vancouver consisted of, okay, the, the new era of the Canucks, the yep. last year of the Grizzlies, the Lions win the Grey Cup, the McSorley trial. I mean, wow. you name it, like everything was going on. Uh, I covered my first Grey Cup, so like, that was cool. Um, mm -hmm. There were, I think, was it that year? Maybe the year after there was the World Figure Skating Championships uh, in hmm. like 2001. Uh, like it was just everything, <laughs> like just so much was going on. Um, not to mention we, we had a PGA golf event that was going on here at the time. <laughs> we had the Molson Indy, which was oh, going down. Like those so, were the days. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just, there was just so much happening. Right. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, when you look at what this city was as a sports town 20 years ago, yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess we have the white caps to replace the Grizzlies, but yeah. let's face it. MLS pales in comparison to what the NBA yeah. is. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. What a time to get here. Yeah. So it was basically the first half of your relatively the first half of your life uh, in Ontario. And then now your second half out here on the West coast, pretty cool. And, and so on and so forth. So your yeah, the score that's to the mid two thousands, I guess. Yeah. So yep. I was at the score until 2006 and yep. then um, I got a call one day while I was covering uh, it was the day before opening day for the blue Jays season in 2006 yeah. And I got a phone call and uh, the number was familiar enough to me that there was only one person who ever called me from that number. And it was a guy named Sean McCormick, who was uh, from sports yeah. page fame and yes. who was married to Jennifer Hedger. And so in those days, both TSN and Sportsnet were kind of up at the same facility. Mm. It's the weirdest shit pardon my language but it's, it's just but it was that's just kind of how it worked and so this number showed up and <laughs> you know he had played a couple of jokes on me and it burned me once pretty good uh so i he called i get this call i answer it and it's like hey james and yeah it's 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 mark millier from tsn and 
yeah, whatever, ha, 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 you know, excuse me, yeah, and I, like, kind of launch into some obscenities because I assume it's my buddy, and, uh, and, and then finally I said something probably just offensive enough that he finally erupted with laughter, and when I heard the laugh, I was like, oh, man. That's not Sean. That's not Sean. And I, it's like, is this really Mark? And he's just, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I am so sorry. And, and <laughs> like, you know, not in your stomach. You're like, oh my God, like I have just torched any sort of possible, yeah. you know, whatever this reason for calling. And he said, look, real quick, would you be interested in coming to TSN? Uh, I said, um, you know, I got to get back to work here, but yes, I would be mm -hmm. foolish to not uh, be interested. So yeah. uh, it, it was just, you know, okay, well, let's, let's talk. And so, yeah, so I made the move in the summer of 2006. I went to TSN and spent seven years there and man, what an experience. Um, yeah. I mean, the score was, was tremendous. I, I mean, I, it was such a learning experience for so many things. Um, you know, it was, it was really emotional to leave, but you know, I, I left Ottawa for, for Toronto. I left Toronto for Vancouver. I left Vancouver for Toronto, uh, you know, all for the score. And so, yeah. you know, I had really kind of grown up, um, you know, and learned my independence really kind of put myself on the map, I think from an industry standpoint at the score and, and then uh, joined TSN, which just really kind of took it to another level with profile and and yes. um, and the the opportunity. I mean, man, that I they gave me a chance to travel everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. obviously, 2010 covering the Olympics yes. certainly at one of the pinnacles of my career. But um, you know, but to cover man to cover NBA games, you know, live events as a sideline reporter in the NBA and hosting opportunities and covering playoff series, but, you know, covering the NHL's first game in Europe in London, England, going nice. to the Raptors training camp in in Venice, Italy, um, you know, it was just, it was just a whole different layer of resources uh, that, you know, TSN had compared to the score and, um, to get the opportunity to host on Sports Center, to, to have a chance to fill in for Michael Landsberg on Off the Record. I mean, <laughs> my God, it's it's funny. That, you know, that show has obviously gone by the wayside. And, yeah. you know, and I think it had lost a lot of its luster, you know, in the last few years. But my mm -hmm. goodness, I, I don't think people can overstate the impact that Michael Landsberg had. Like, that yeah. was a long-running talk show and current affairs show in Canada. Like, never mind just sports. Yeah. Like, yeah. That show got what twenty years, and yeah. I mean, it moved the meter from time to time. And so, I'll admit, James, uh, I watched it yeah. mostly for the wrestling interviews. Yeah, yes, of course, <laughs> the wrestling fans. And so that's where, like, you would hear, you know, there was the kind of the first real, the birth of the shoot interviews. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, the, you know, Vince McMahon and you know Bret, Bret Hart. Hart. Yes. And, yes. All, <laughs> you know, the first few Bret Hart interviews, and you know, and Steve Austin. But to just see to see those guys kind of talking out of character, mm -hmm. they did huge numbers, huge yes. numbers. And, and that, was, that was really, honestly, those were the shows that really put off the record on the map. It was yeah. the wrestling shows. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty cool. Not that I ever That's did any of them, but like it was cool. I watched them. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so when you were there at TSN, was it still Vancouver based? I was no, I had, I had moved back to, uh, so what Elliot, you know what, Elliot Friedman left the score in 2003 to join mm. hockey night in Canada. And they needed somebody to be, they need, well, they, they wanted to move somebody into the role of senior reporter. Yep. And so I think based on where I was, they had looked at me as the guy who could take over that spot and but they wanted that role to be toronto based and, uh, and that's you know, why you're still at the score yes okay. yeah and gotcha. it's funny because not a lot of people know this but it was funny because the canucks were in training camp in vernon at the time and this was 03 and barry mcdonald um it's funny how life happens sometimes but sean mccormick had just was in the process of leaving sports page to move east to join Sportsnet. Hmm. So there was an opening at 
sports page and Barry and I had talked and, um, you know, we had, we had had a good conversation and man, like I admired what sports page was all about, you know, oh, yeah. I really, really liked, you know, what they did. And I really thought it was an opportunity for me to plant my flag in the, in the sand here, so to speak, and really kind of, mm-hmm. you know, firmly entrench myself here in the local market. And we had talked and I think we had kind of agreed upon, um, a number that we both felt comfortable about. And when Barry kind of took it to upper management, not to speak out of turn here, sorry, yeah. Barry, uh, but it's, you know, they just wouldn't sign off on mm. what we were both kind of of the same page of, that would work. Yeah. And so they didn't sign off on it. And so he didn't have the budget to basically hire me. And so we kind of, yeah, so it kind of, died on the vine and it was funny i you know i remember barry kind of remarking he was frustrated about the decision and thinking you know who knows how much longer i'll be here with i think he felt like okay this the writing was on the wall that things were going to start changing and and it's funny because i think it was six months to a year later that barry was gone from sports page where he had Uh gone over to 1040 um but for me that opportunity was happening at the same time that Elliot had left hockey night. So it was kind of, well, do I, do I go back East and take over this role as senior reporter or can I try to stay here? Um, And, you know, and I could have just stayed as a Vancouver reporter as well, but Mm -hmm. I, I I was ready for a new challenge and uh, you know, and the sports page opportunity didn't um, didn't pan out. I took the opportunity to go back East and, you know, and at the time I was kind of a, a single guy. Um, and so just kind of focused on my career and traveling around a lot at that, at that stage. And so this was yeah. 2004. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for a couple of years spent, uh, my life, uh, living out of a suitcase more than anything. And, uh, <laughs> but just seeing the world on the company dime and, and it right. was, it was, a, it was a great experience. I had a lot of fun with it. And, um, cool. yeah, there wasn't a lot of looking back. Um, once I, uh, you know, I'd spent two years at the score once I had moved back to Toronto and then yeah. TSN ultimately called. So seven or eight with the score, seven or eight with TSN, that brings us to the mid 2010s. And then what happens yep. after that? Yeah. So I was at uh, TSN radio in Toronto and uh, shockingly enough, working for a startup radio station. I did that at 1040, did that with 650 <laughs> and did it with 1050 uh, in Toronto. And uh, you know what? I, I just had an opportunity the radio situation wasn't it just wasn't working as i had hoped it, mm. we started off well but you know i i I'd, I'd own a lot of it in the sense that we just i didn't feel i, I needed to be better like knowing what mm. i know now i think there's a lot of things i could have done differently um from an on-air standpoint uh i think when we first started i think it really had the right energy but you know, it was just, it was interesting. The, the, there was just, there were a lot of moving parts. There were a lot of things that were promised that weren't. Mm. And so when I had a chance to go back to the TV side, I just kind of decided I'm going to make a decision for myself. And you know what? Sportsnet had an opportunity and an opening to go out West. And so I took it and I just felt like life was really busy with my young kids at the time. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like, you know what, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go out West. I want to go back out West. And, uh, I felt like time is currency and I felt like I would maybe find some of that and a little more of a work-life balance by moving out West. And so took the opportunity to go to Sportsnet and, uh, and started there in summer of 2013 and, um, TV first, TV yeah, first. Yeah. 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 And so, it was uh, it was funny because the role was really ambiguously defined, um, <laughs> but it was it was working alongside Don uh, Taylor for the first yeah. year. But man, it was such an extreme to to leave TSN and the resources that were there in the East compared to what was here mm-hmm. out west. And it was funny, like I started out in the middle of August and everybody was on holidays everybody 
So, you know, Don was, Don was on holidays until September, which good for him. Uh, mm-hmm. C-Mac <laughs> was on holidays. I think Murph was on holidays. Um, you know, uh, our assistant producer out here was, was on holidays, <laughs> but it was just, all of a sudden it was like walking into a studio. And th- I think this is a testament to Don's abilities and his energy because, you know, you walk into an empty studio after sitting in an empty newsroom for yeah. the, you know, for hours on end. And then all of a sudden trying to fire up all this energy. Yes. And it was, it was hard. It was, it was, it felt so different uh, getting used to it. And so your studio control room was all in the East and, um, yeah, it, it was tricky. Wow. And, and just, you know what, we had s- such a black cloud that kind of hung over us, you know, working at, at, uh, at West Second mm-hmm. in Columbia that, you know, I think I, I, I didn't quite understand it when I first got out there, but I think there was a real pessimistic view from, you know, not to put words in their mouth, but mm-hmm. I think between Craig and uh, Craig McEwen and Don Taylor and, and Dan Murphy, I think there had been kind of a, just sort of a, a frustration or kind of throw your hands up sort of yeah. thing at, at Sportsnet. And, you know, I kind of came in ready to roll and I didn't quite understand their frustration at first, but it didn't take long to figure it out that it just didn't feel like there was ever a give a shit. Yeah. Um, from, and, you know, and, and ultimately things changed rather quickly because I think the real issue was, not long after I got out there, there was a new head honcho for Rogers by the name of Guy mm. Lawrence. Mm. And, you know, they started eliminating a lot of, you know, senior managers and middle managers. So our VP of the newsroom who believed in Sportsnet Pacific and regional brand and content, uh, he was gone. And mm. so by losing him, it really kind of changed the mandate and the perspective. So suddenly Sportsnet was, we're going national. You know, we're getting rid of regionalism. It's dead and we're going national. So around that time, Carolyn Cameron, uh, they wanted to do a national morning show as well. And they brought her out. And so the two of us hosted. So I would host Sportsnet Pacific with Dawn. And then after Dawn was done, after we were done that show, then I would have to tape, mm. you know, uh, Sportsnet morning, uh, Sportsnet Central AM with, with Carolyn and I. And so after the first year I'm there, all of a sudden, you know, Don's not there anymore. C-Mac's not there anymore. And, you know, we're kind of walking around with this, this cloud hanging over us going, okay, well, when does this happen to us? Because we just knew that they were going to shut down production at some point. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. And so it was, it was just, I loved working with Carolyn. I had so much fun. I, I should also say like, I don't feel like I, I, I don't feel like Don and I, I feel like Don and I really could have kicked ass together as a two man team. Like I, think I really so. think yeah. we could have, we really, but I just don't feel like the infrastructure and the company, like I had fun when we were on air, Don and I, but mm-hmm. I feel like we could have been so much better had we been in an environment that yeah, set up to succeed, to feel like, yeah. feel good. And, yeah. and so, and Carolyn and I, you know, we had a lot of fun together and Carolyn brought this fresh approach and it was the same thing that I think Carolyn and I, I think we had a lot of fun working together as well. Um, but again, it just wasn't, it wasn't a long-term solution to where, you know, not to get too personal, but I was going through a divorce at the time and it just wasn't going to make sense for me to move back, uh, across the country and Mm -hmm. have my kids living here. And so, um, you know, when they shut down, like it was essentially, well, it's your job or, you know, or, or here and they had to, you know, they were shutting down production. It was like, okay, well, sorry, see ya. And, uh, we got to lose some bodies anyway. So you're out. Um, and you know, I think I was probably a big cap hit for, you know, they weren't really using me a whole lot. And, <laughs> and, and the way that the show was, you know, it, it, it sucked because we had launched this show and we had a whole bunch of creative ideas. And we had a really good gung ho producer and a great, great production assistant as, as mm. his assistant producer. And they were all taken off our show to go work with Tim and Sid. <laughs> so, uh. I mean, and I love those guys, man. Like I grew up with the score with those guys. Yeah. And so I was super happy for the opportunities that those guys have had, but man, selfishly speaking, it was like, 
of course. You're killing us. Like you just took all of our assets and stripped our, you know, to, yeah. to, to bare bones. And it was like, okay, like the writing's on the wall. So yeah. Um, yeah. So that was two and a half years on the TV side at Sportsnet that yeah. just, uh, yeah, it was hard. Um, you know, we, we had a really fun team behind the scenes with Craig Cheeseman and Dan Chomiak mm. and working with Carolyn Cameron and, um, you know, and Dawn as well. But man, it just, uh, it just, it just didn't, um, it just didn't have that energy. Like it just, there was always that sort of, are we going to lose our jobs today? <sighs> like that. And, and honestly, that's a crappy way to <sighs> go to work every day, you know, yeah. to, to go through that and, and to, to have that feeling for 18 months to essentially yeah. going to work every day. Like, okay, is this it? you know and then you know you'd hear about a round of layoffs on the city tv side and it was just yeah. man this sucks so yeah it's unfortunate wow. there were a real lot of really like there were really the people were good people but just the the not in an environment to succeed definitely yeah. had that feeling but that being wow. said that rogers was nice enough to give me a couple of opportunities <laughs> uh months later i i you know, I needed to work and mm -hmm. it, there wasn't a lot of severance after that first contract with the TV side. So I took an opportunity at News 1130, going back to news that I hadn't done since my days in Ottawa. Yeah. And I had a lot of fun with it. It was, it was great. I mean, the hours were, you know, brutal getting up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Um, that was, that was hard. Uh, but I, I liked it for the sense that every day was a new day. Yeah. Um, everything had a fresh challenge and I didn't take my work home with me with that job. Like, nice, uh, you know, nice. once I was kind of done with the job, I, I kind of, you turned it off for the day and you'd go in the next day and all right, what do we got? And now that being said, you know, you don't really cover a lot of good news stories, right? I mean, yeah, it's, of course, yeah. it, you know, there are a lot of, you know, shootings and homicides and, yeah. you know, and crime and punishment and, you know, and then just stories that, you know, impact people and, Unfortunately, you look at most news stories, like there's not a lot of, hey, we start tonight's news with a real feel good story. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, over the course of 365 days, I'm going to say there's maybe five of those days. Like there's not yeah. a lot of, yeah, that was great. What a great news story today. Um, so I did that for about uh, eight months. And then uh, Rogers got the rights for the uh, Vancouver Canucks uh, for radio. And so they um, provided me with an opportunity to host a morning show that they did not tell me who I'd be working with. They just said, uh, you know, we'd like for you to be our morning show host. Uh, we've got a real good mix of people that we'd like for you to work with. And yeah. I'm like, well, who? We cannot say, but money was good. And it was about double what I was making at 1130. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and honestly, like had I had the money been comparable, I might've stayed at 1130. I really enjoyed it. I think I was at a mm -hmm. point in my life where I felt the stories were relatable to me as who mm -hmm. I am as a human being now. Um, and so anyway, went to uh, joined uh, 650 and found out uh, basically on launch day that, uh, or not launch, well, not launch day, but uh, I guess, the first day we were all going into a room together to find out who we were working with. So, And your first co-host was? I was working with Steve Darling and Myra Lawrence when we first right. started uh, at 650. And then that's right. I remember that. And then after that, it, um, who was the next one? It was it, by the way, we've blown, I'm fine for time. If we've blown completely past the half an hour, are you still good? Cause I, I appreciate your, your honesty, your humility, your transparency. This is riveting yeah. to me. And I think it's funny. I, I'm, I'm, I'm giggling because uh, James, on my channel, there's everyone that's about, like my age, your age for sure, and then maybe 35 and up. They're gonna appreciate references to sports page, the score, TSN, all the, and then all the teenagers and young adults are saying, "Who's you know what's the guy talking yeah. about?" Right? <laughs> who's who's, who's this old monster? Exactly. Um, yeah. So yes. after Steve and Myra, it went to who? Yeah. So Steve, Steve was gone pretty quick. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there were some opportunities that were presented to him and uh, I, that were, I think he felt were a better fit for him. So Steve pieced out pretty quick and, yeah. and, and Myra was reshuffled to where she was kind of a Canucks reporter. And so yeah. they brought in Perry, uh, Perry Solkowski and Rick yeah. Dollywall. And, That's right. Yeah. And, and Rick and I honestly, like Rick and I had gone back, um, 
you know, from our days at, at 1040 together. Yes. Uh, so, so Rick and I had known each other, you know, by that point, you know, we had known each other for probably 15, 17 years by that point. Right. Like, mm. I mean, Rick and I go back 20 years now or so. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we had, we had gone back from, from our days together. And uh, when we both, I, I forgot to even mention, I, I worked for a year at, at 1040 when it first launched. Uh, uh, about okay. Four months in, I hosted mornings at, at, at Team 1040 in those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, I worked with uh, Bill Courage and Lee Powell. Lee and, Powell, yes. uh, The Beast, John Connors. And uh, oh my God, I had so many different co-hosts and fill-ins, Kathy Kovacs and... Jay Janauer did a couple of shows and Farhan Lalji did a few shows. Yeah, yeah. Trent Klatt hosted with me for a week, I think, <laughs> or one or two episodes. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was fun. I didn't have much of a life for a year, but I, but, but I yeah. doubled my salary for a year, which was kind of yeah. cool, but I, I didn't sleep a whole lot for between in the year of 2002. So, wow. Um, but but anyway, long story short, uh, I worked with Rick and, and Perry um, for about I guess we had about I guess we had about a year and a half together. And mm. and Rick, it's funny because Rick had a reputation of no, he didn't talk to anybody at eleven thirty. He just kind of was quietly. And Rick was kind of anonymous at that point. It's funny, like Rick yeah, Rick, yeah. Or Rick would break stories, but it just never seemed to. I don't know if if it just it never really was given the traction or the respect or or the profile and and rick i think his twitter account was just kind of anonymous and yeah and you look at how rick is really how rick has kind of become consumed by social media yeah ricky yeah yeah can't stop uh he, he, he'll but, see this too he's been on here he'll oh see yeah, this. yeah 100 <laughs> he will yeah he'll, he'll look just check for all the likes and uh or slide into his dms right rick um anyway long story short uh <laughs> he he came over and it was an opportunity and and we had a lot of fun it was it was yeah. just a fun energy where you know we just we just i i guess the easiest way to say it we just like to f- with each other yeah and um and yeah. I, I i we had a lot of fun I, I think we had a lot of fun and and rick and i knew there was just a natural we could just kind of kick each other in the butt um <laughs> you know rick was very passionate i think I don't think Rick was everybody's cup of tea behind the scenes um, at 650, but Rick also brought an approach of a tenacity and a hustle to break stories that I think there's a generation that doesn't quite understand or see uh, the value in as much mm-hmm. as, as Rick does. And then look, you have to be wired a certain way to want to be that person and, and yeah. go at all costs. And, and Rick is without question, you know, nobody does it better, I think, or, or hustles in that respect yeah. in this market than, than Dollywall. And yeah. so um, we work together, I think. Um, yeah. And so, but again, we talked about just the cuts and, and just, and look, we're seeing it, uh, you know, in all media realms. So it's not just yeah. Rogers, to, not to just sit here and, and crap on Rogers, but um you know they made a decision to we i think we cut about a fifth of the workforce at at 650 at the time and this was what was this 20 Hmm. yeah late 2019 fall of 2019 and and uh Hmm. rick and and several other guys were you know uh impacted and yeah. It just sucked. It, it, it really, really sucked that losing Rick really hurt. I felt like it really derailed any momentum that we were starting to build as a show um, yes. Yes. and in the morning and, and uh, it hurt. And I don't know if we really ever quite completely had figured out the, the full recipe at the time, but I think we were on the right track and mm. then it was just Perry and I, and mm. And, you know, I think Perry and I are kind of very similar in, in some respects, you know, we're, uh, we're both pretty easygoing guys. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm probably a little more energetic than he is, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, we, but we only really had, I mean, we maybe had a month to work together and then, you know, it was the holiday season and he had taken time off and then I was gone. So we were away for about a month and then we mm. worked for basically two months in studio together 
trying to figure out this new rhythm for our show and COVID hit and suddenly uh-huh. we were working from home for the next, for the next year. And, you know, I just don't know if we were ever, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people were kind of doing, doing this sort of thing, but I think it just, it changed the dynamic and I don't know totally. if, totally. if, um, if, you know, I mean, look, we'll own it. I, I certainly, I certainly felt good with what, what I did. And I felt like I was at a stage where, look, I'm going to do the show I want to do. And yeah. And I think, you know, I think it was probably a learning experience for Perry, um, Mm -hmm. for someone who, you know, when you work in TV, your life, I mean, radio is a lot of work, Mm -hmm. you know, you got to take it home with you. You got to do your homework. You got to study, like, never mind the three hours that you're on the air for, you know, anybody that's worked in talk radio, they'll tell you that there's, there's five to eight hours behind the scenes or 10 hours or 12 hours behind the scenes. Like it's all consuming. You have to know what you're talking about. Like you have to have, you know, perspective, you know, I, I would write a bit at six 30 every morning. I wrote, I had a little bit I'd call Seaball says, yeah, it was like a, a three minute, you know, a little commentary or whatever you want to call it. But that alone was 90 minutes to write Yes, at least 90 minutes. And I'd look for audio drops to incorporate, to just kind of, to have some fun with it. So, I mean, but for just three or four minutes of content, yeah, that's, you know, that was 90 minutes. Never mind the rest of yes, of what you're breaking down. You, you, you know, mm-hmm. there's three hours of watching a Canucks game that you have to be prepared to dissect the next day. Um, you know, and not miss things, right? You, you have to be aware of what's happening, whether it's the World Series or the NBA or the NFL and, um, and just trying to stay on top of all of it. And, um, wow. you know, and at the same time, trying to be present as a parent. So, you know, you, you go to work for, but, you know, when, on the days that you go into studio, you factor in whether, you know, it's your commute, your prep time. Mm-hmm. You know, I would, you know, on the those days at early mornings, I would usually go in an hour before the show, usually hang out for about a half an hour to an hour post show. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're there probably for five hours. Um, yeah. You know, you throw in your commute and all that. I mean, now you're, you're probably six and a half hours before you have even prepped for the next day. Yes. Right. So there's, there's minimum, minimum, minimum three hours of what you had to do. So days were long and um but it was fun like i i liked our team um i just you know as a startup you really need to have there needs to be an investment there needs to feel like you've got support behind you and i don't think um the infrastructure is quite there to succeed you know i mean 1040 had a had a good veteran roster guys Mm -hmm. with a lot of experience Mm -hmm. And the contributors were all very strong voices as well. Mm -hmm. And I think there were a few strong voices at at, at 650 and contributors, but, you know, it didn't take long for, you know, within a year, you know, there were just a lot of resources that were kind of pulled away, right? Right. All of a sudden there was an evening show that was no longer there. Weekend programming was sparse at best. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, people that were, you know, doing this and that were suddenly no longer there. And so it kind of really, it really kind of screwed with the, the dynamic and the infrastructure. And, you know, it was, you know, it just, it just didn't feel like being again. And I would just say, you know, I'm, I'm certainly thankful of the opportunities that Rogers gave me. But I don't think at any time in the years that I worked at Rogers did I ever feel like I was put in a position to succeed as an employee. Wow. Maybe outside of working at, at 1130, but even at 1130, it was funny because, you know, you were kind of told don't speed in the company vehicle, <laughs> you know, don't speed, don't text and drive, but you have 45 minutes or you've got an hour to be in, you, you've got an hour to get to Abbotsford and from, from Broadway and Canby or from 8th and Canby, you have an hour to get to Abbotsford and file a story. Oh, and also like send us a 15 second teaser as well to kind of set the scene. Of course. Uh, what's happening. And if you can get, a, get find an interview with somebody and edit that audio all before five o'clock in the morning and it's four <laughs> o'clock and you know, you can leave the meeting now and you've got 55 minutes. Right. But again, don't speed, <laughs> don't text and drive. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I need all that shit for five o'clock <laughs> in, in 55 minutes from now. So, I mean, anybody who lives in Abbotsford or has done that commute <laughs> knows. Yeah. That, yeah. I have a few coworkers workers here. They tell me about it every day. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you, you know, you got to, you know, that I might have <laughs> so, spent a couple of times. <laughs> So I said this before I pressed record and, and you know me to be genuine. I did listen to you and Perry quite a bit. I, you know, you were gracious enough to have me on a couple of times to talk about my latest goofy song creation with Marie. Well, we just couldn't or... find, we just couldn't book anybody else. We just didn't know. <laughs> uh, we could, Pavel was busy and we, McGillney just wouldn't return our call. And... Well, hey, I'll, I'll be, I'll take third, uh, third place to those guys. So there you go, I did exactly. listen. And, and I always appreciated, um, uh, you know, things like your, your references to pop culture, whether I would always text you about Aaliyah back and forth song, and then you would get <laughs> connects in a song. And then you would, you would always tell the story of how you were an extra on set with it. So I just loved a lot of those type of things. I, I, let's do one more question about that and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about what you're doing now okay. um how quickly after you got the news of uh your show its demise how long did it take you to get out of that funk because i i presume that that was a tough time as well no 90 seconds wow <laughs> truly yeah I, I wow i'll be honest with you i i think I had felt for probably, you know, I got three and a half years doing mornings at 650. Yeah. And I think when I had signed my contract, I thought to myself, man, if I get three years, I'll be tickled pink. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I just, I had probably for about a year and a half prior, I, I would say it really hit after, after Rick was gone, it really hit me that, it's like, right. I don't, I don't, I don't like this anymore. And this, and, and I, I, what I mean is I don't like, I don't like the infrastructure of the industry that, you know, every six months to a year, there's just a, a bludgeoning yeah. of, of people getting cut and it sucks. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I think I had wanted out for a while but I think had I facilitated it on my terms, I don't know if I would have got the, the, the farewell handshake that I got mm -hmm. um, by, mm -hmm. by them severing a thing. So, of course, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I think I knew the end was near. I don't think, you know, and I, and I you know, I, I really like Perry. I really like Mike English. Uh, yeah. I like Art, um, you know, love working yeah. with Balak too. I think like everybody are good people, but I think everybody would admit that it just wasn't, I just don't think the show ever felt right for everybody collectively. Uh, yeah. I think there were some elements that were really fun and I think we, we had some right ideas, but I just don't know if we were consistent enough with that for three hours uh, yeah. as, a, as a team. Right. And so I think we figured we'd probably get till the end of the Canucks season. But I think with 1040's demise, it yeah. created an opportunity. And, you know, there was the, the head of the national radio uh, of, of sports radio and Rogers had recently had been ousted prior to that. Um, yes, yes. Well, so there was just a lot of volatility. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think, there was an opportunity to move and to put in a plug and play show uh, that they put in Halford and Bruff. And you know what? It makes sense. You know, I think they had a good number over at 1040 and those guys had built in chemistry having worked together for, I don't know, uh, I guess probably 10 years. It sounds yeah, like I, including the States. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like I, yeah. I think that those guys have had, you know, some time together for a long time. So so I totally understand from a business side, um, you know, those guys getting that opportunity. Uh, I was surprised to see Andrew Walker kind of gone like that one to me was Walker is a, you know, people may not agree with his opinions, but Andrew Walker's a good talk radio personality. Yes, I agree. You, know, you may not, you may not agree with him. You may not like the guy, but he's a, good talk radio personality and comfortable enough to wear um the bad guy hat yeah. if you will yeah. and and that's uh and that's a good thing because there's not enough of that i i think yeah. and and you know and walks does his homework and he's and yeah. you know he, he pounded the pavement for a long time especially covering hockey you know covering junior hockey and you know i think there's something to be said about people that that work their way up through the industry that 
you know, it's not just expecting to cover the NHL right away, but, you know, go pay your dues, go, yeah. go cover the American league, go cover junior hockey and, you know, establish your contacts and, and along the way. And anyway, uh, I got a lot of time for, I got a lot of time for walks of the personality, but you know, I digested the call. It was kind of, Oh, okay. That was quicker than I thought. Uh, Cause we had also planned for a family vacation to go skiing. So, um, <laughs> but I remember, you know, Rogers offered me another position within the company mm-hmm. and I thought about it and, you know, I appreciated that, you know, they wanted to keep me on board. Um, but I just felt like, I just thought to myself based in that role that they were offering I could do that and, you know, then what happens in a year from now where, Mm. well, here comes another round of layoffs, you know, there's that guy over there. Um, And so I think I thought that I was maybe vulnerable or just didn't see the uh, long-term potential uh, to be there. And, and I just, and the hours and all of it yeah. uh, just didn't work for me. And so it was, okay, well, I've, you know, I've got some time to kind of figure this out and yeah. I'll take, uh, I'll take what's behind door number two, Alex. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah. And, and I've felt very good since. And, wow. Wow. you know, I, I, I haven't, there's the day to day I haven't missed. I think every once in a while, there's kind of the days, like the fun days that you kind of go, oh, it'd be nice to be kind of engaged, but Honestly, I've been really busy. I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough uh, for the last three years to be the play-by-play voice for the NHL video game yeah. franchise from yeah. Electronic Arts, EA Sports. And so there's a whole new generation of, uh, of people who've discovered me, whether they yes. like me or not. And uh, so that's been kind of cool. Um, and the fact that it's kind of come full circle because the whole reason I wanted to get into this business was to do play-by-play. Yeah, and I, I want to get to that in a second. And here we, I am. This is, you know, this is so good because it, it's funny what you mentioned about Andrew Walker. I, I was able to talk to him on, on one of these chats. And mm-hmm. yeah, I came out of there with a, I already respected him because I, I knew his shtick on the radio. But after speaking like this one on one, I, yeah, total respect for him and respect for you, James, because I am glad that we took the time to detail your 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 journey to here because i love what you said about getting your reps in whether it's a minor league this or i love how you said karate and and whatever all those other sports because i think uh for aspiring i'm, I'm not one of them i'm 47 years old right i like doing this as a hobby and just chatting with people and getting i'll be you, but... i'll be there i'll be there in six weeks buddy okay. i'll be right oh, there with you so... you're born in 74 i'm a 74 oh, no I'm wonder we're... 74 so maybe an honorary <laughs> 75 but yeah. i love it I love it. So, I, and that's the thing, like, I think uh, for aspiring people who want to get into this, it's about getting reps in and, and creating content, no matter what platform and, 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 and getting that and not thinking that it's going to be a straight shot from BCIT to, to whatever. Right. So I, yeah. I, I really appreciate you spending all that time. I want to talk about this EA sports stuff, because here's the thing. Um, our, we play, we've had, the, uh, we play it every year. So I, I get to hear your voice and I usually get to hear you explaining how my son just walked me and then, and then deked out my, my gold tenant. <laughs> and I, I did this stupid 24 hour live stream. You might've seen it about a month ago. And, and one of the things is my YouTube subscribers love watching my kids pound me in EA, uh, in, in hockey. Um, so I'll, I'll get advice from you how to play it another time. I, I want to know. Hey, I just talk about it. That doesn't mean I know how to play it. Like, trust me, I just went through be a, I just went through be a pro mode where I was yeah. uh, effectively a healthy scratch or benched, uh, sitting on the fourth line most of the year with the Montreal Canadiens. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, drafted to a team my dad hated, uh, taught me to hate growing up, and and then sat on the bench most of the games. Yeah, there, there's so, so much. I, I hear you. Yeah, I yeah. hated listening to me too. <laughs> Like, yeah, this kid's not good enough. What they got? What's he doing here? Why isn't he yeah. been sent down? <laughs> so there's so much I could ask you, but uh, really, I, I want to know a couple of things. Um, start to finish for one year, you know, for one edition of the franchise. How many hours, roughly, do you think you're in a in a booth, saying all these lines over and over? Are we talking hundreds of hours? Are we talking thousands? Are we talking a couple dozen? Like, I kind of frame I'm it a, for us. Uh, I'm under contract to do about 250 to 300 hours a year. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So and are, are you repeating the same? Yeah. No, we, we add, we just continue to add new content, uh, wow. just more and more layers and depth. So, yeah. uh, this is all oh, we got here. We've got, um, 
Oh, I don't know. I think we do about two days a week for yeah. about four hour sessions. Wow. And sorry, James, what I meant about the repeat is, are you saying, uh, put calls in with the snipe and like, are you repeating that line five times and take the best one? Or is it only one take wonders kind of thing? No, for the most part, they're, I mean, most of, I would say overwhelmingly, we kind of just do each one on one take. Uh, wow. I mean, there's, wow. Some, there's some that, you know, you, you misfire and you, you <laughs> tweak it or you say it the wrong way and, or just, you know what, uh, you, the mic popped. And so yeah. you, you do it again, uh, you know, whatever, two or three takes, but for the most part, I mean, we'll do for an example, like, I think we're up to close to, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think we're close to somewhere in the neighborhood of about 5,000 different names in the video game now, wow. right? And and we really tried to make a point to, to diversify the names too, where, yeah. you know, names, Sobalski, yeah. unheard of 20 years ago to be in a video game, unless Sobalski was an NHL player, right? And yeah. now names like that are more common and you know, yeah. they've incorporated names from the Western League, from the American League, yeah. from, uh, from the Quebec League, from, you know, from yeah. parts around the world. And and so it's great. And so now you've got more and more prospects that are wow. in it, and you've got more and more NHL names, and then you take yeah. alumni names. And yeah. We won't get into what happened with the Marlies because that's another conversation. But my, as you know, Dusty is my first cousin, the goaltending coach of the goaltender. Do you remember? Did you ever say Dusty Emo in any of the in the games? Like I don't know. You know what? That's a good question. Uh, I don't feel like I don't feel like Dusty's name. Yeah. I don't know if Dusty's names come up. Yeah, because because, you know, he's he, more of a, because he was always more of a coach than he was correct a player. Yeah, right? goaltending so. coach. He did play for Japan back back in the '98 Olympics. So I don't know if you go that far for like national teams. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the year that Gretzky sat on the bench in the shootout. Very good. Yeah, very good. So take us behind the curtain for one more question. Then are you simply saying names and phrases, and then the computer is smart enough to match them up, or are you actually like? And that's not you. Or are you actually saying every player's name in every different phrase like that's kind of no wow i'll say i'll say every every player's name and we we do what is called a buy stitch so okay uh so um you know takes you know it's a nice shot but you know nice nice shot by sabalski nice nice shot by crosby nice (laughs) nice shot by besser nice shot by hughes nice shot by Pedersen. But saying it at a certain level of energy that they can make that edit around the buy. Yes. So then you've got the other stuff or, you know, and then there's the, the a two stitch, right? So it'd be, uh, you know, passes the puck to Pedersen, passes the puck to Demko, passes the puck to Horvat, passes the puck to Barron, passes the puck to Jovanovsky. It's, and so having those points to edit, that, wow. you know, you've got those at, there's a big hit by Jones, you know, there's a big hit by Matthews, you know, yeah. what a shot by Ovechkin. And so you've got all these other contexts that you've kind of, you know, you're doing about 10 at a time where, you know, tiptoes across the line, you know, gains the zone into the offensive area. Into the I'm going to make, zone. I can make one of those, my ringtone, just so you know, I just love your voice. Yeah. No, there that's you really- <laughs> Well, you're the only one, but thank you. That's really cool, James. That's really cool. And then the programmers, they make the magic happen. Obviously, they've got to match the AI and all that kind of stuff, which we won't get into. But that's so you are saying every phrase. So it's not like they're you're leaving a blank for the name. You're actually no. doing every single no, wow. We, we 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 do all the names. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's neat. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm gonna have to book another call for you just to talk about the video game because I'm really fascinated. I'll just I'll just find you and ask you some stuff. That's really cool. Okay, let's do one uh, one more question then, and then we'll do rapid fire and let, let okay. you get out of here. This is awesome. Uh, you are play by play for the Abbotsford Canucks. Tell me, just tell me about that experience so far. It's been awesome. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I, uh, the whole reason I wanted to get into this business, you know, 25 plus years ago was to do play by play and. You know, there just weren't a lot of opportunities. Or the, the opportunities that were there were pretty much, you know, locked in by, you know, very established broadcasters. And <laughs> you kind of grow old in those positions, right? And uh, I mean, look at Vin Scully and Bob Cole and, you know, guys that get into their 80s. And um, so anyway, uh, long, <laughs> look, well, I mean, look, I mean, look at the history of the Vancouver Canucks here in this market, right? Yep. How, yep. Many, how many television play-by-play guys? I mean, Jim Robson, John Shorthouse. Jim Hewson. Yeah, that's it. Right. 
that, that's kind of it, right? Your name's got to start with a J, apparently. Well, I, you're <laughs> you're telling me there's a chance, uh, but no, seriously, like I, I just it was an opportunity that I think I was curious about, um, and we had a conversation, and it seemed to fit, and. Yeah. You know, I think the plan right now is to do home games and we'll see where it kind of evolves to. Obviously, the organization, they've been incredibly busy just trying to get up off the ground yeah. uh, after, you know, honestly, Re relocating a franchise and, and trying yeah, to do it. And, and, and hiring it. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, I think so far, I think feedback seems to be positive. Um, yeah. And for me, it's great to just get my reps um, again and and doing it uh, and just having fun. Uh, you know, I think there's obviously an element of professionalism that I can mm. bring. Uh, yes. Obviously, I think I have a lot of experience, but from a play-by-play -play standpoint, it's been a while. I mean, obviously the video game is one thing, but to do it live and carry the play through uh, has been an adjustment. And for me, in my mind, I want to try to carry that sort of energy that I bring to the video game into uh, the broadcast booth for live events. So cool. um, I'm trying to do that as best I can and also not, you know, tear the crap out of my voice at the same time. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I definitely want to sell the goal and I definitely yes. want to sell the hit and I want to sell the save. And I, I definitely want it to be fun and engaging for somebody who listens to feel like, man, like, this sounds like a good game right now. And awesome. So, um, for the for those of I've us who are four and they haven't yeah. kicked me out just yet so good for those of us who are who are consumed or have not had a chance to check out an abbas for canucks game yet quickly give me one forward give me one defenseman give me one goalie i know there's only a couple to choose from that have really impressed you one forward, uh, one def Arthur defenseman, one goalie. Zilovs has really impressed me so far in yep. goal for uh for abbotsford he, yep. he looked very good um good. i'd say sheldon dries has been a lot of fun to watch uh kind of a veteran forward uh Mm -hmm. uh, for Abby, but uh, he just seems to find ways to score. And Justin Bailey was a lot of fun uh, when he, when he was uh, when he was there the first weekend. But obviously, he's playing with the big boys now. Big boys, yeah. Uh, and on the back end, um, I'll tell you what. Um, you know, Travis Hamannick played last Saturday, and it was just like it was like as soon as I'm watching him, probably a period in, it's like he's ready to go. Like <laughs> he, he, he's, he's ready to go. He, he, you can, you can send him up right. He, he might be able to catch the third period of the Oilers game right now and help. But uh, I'll tell you what, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been pleasantly surprised by what I've seen from Jet Wu. Awesome. And I, I thought watching him the first weekend on the road, he looked a little lost at mm. times, but I would say he seems like he's settled down. He's getting plenty of opportunities in all sorts of facets, whether it's, penalty kill power play um he's he's seeing you know critical minutes at critical times and i would say he's not ready for prime time just yet right. uh i think he probably needs to get a little bigger too yeah but i i like what i'm seeing from him i i think he's showing me a little more of an offensive touch than i think i expected it's not necessarily resulting in points but you know, he's pinching at the right time. And, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on what I'm seeing from Jet Wu so far. I think there's a ways to go, but, mm -hmm. but I like what I'm seeing. And I would also say that uh, Klimovich as well. Yeah. Danila, he was the one I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Danila Klimovich, uh, he's an 18 year old playing in the American League that's hard. Like that's a men's yeah. league. You know, it, it is hard to have success as a youngster, but you know, got off to a very quick start. They're giving him some minutes uh, with the man advantage. Uh, you know, he's kind of a third line guy right now. Um, he's, hmm. he's a third line. Uh, he's a third line player uh, who's kind of second unit power play, but he's, uh, but you know, I, I like what I see so far because there's some size there. I think he's got some skill. Every once in a while, when he gets in the open ice, he kind of shows the stick handling, and yeah. and it's pretty good. Very cool, oh, James. This is amazing. Uh, to wrap up, I always like to do the five hole appropriately named because five quick questions, not to put you in a hole or anything, but just no. But we were going to be in a hole quick because the kids are just walking in the door from school. So are you okay right. with that? Yeah, yeah. We'll have to do the five hole quick. Okay, real quick. Number one, what's the best sport you're at? You're a good athlete in. What's the best at sport? Best sport uh, as an athlete. Ooh, uh, I'll say jogging. 
Awesome. No, we love the dog. We love, this is family life, man. This is awesome. Jogging number two, you're yeah. starting a franchise. You're starting a franchise, Pedersen or Hughes? Uh, I'll take Hughes. Cool. Number three, you won't offend me either way because I'm half Japanese food or Chinese food? Japanese. Big sushi cool. household here. Oh, okay. We got to go out. Number four. I went to Japan last year, actually. <laughs> friend is 40, so, hey, Odin, chill out. Awesome. This is our no, family. That's great. Number four. You're, they're taking you out for dinner. Are you going out with Aquilini, Benning, or Green? They're taking you out for dinner and they're paying. Travis, because he likes high-end tequila. Okay, there you go. And finally, finally, then we'll let you go and get to your beautiful family. What's one thing, I, I, we've learned a lot today, but what's one more thing that people don't know about James Sabalski? That they don't know about me. Um, yeah. I, uh, you know what? I, I love Motown. Awesome. Awesome. Perfect way to end. So uh, speak, you can get back to your girls, my girl get, I tried, that wasn't the best segue ever, but uh, thank you. It was funny. They left the house and we started talking. They came back and we're still talking. So you can explain that. Talking, yes, I know. <laughs> Brenda, Brenda's shaking her head. He never shuts up. He never shuts up. Is she, is she talking about me or you? Me. Okay, probably just... you too. I mean, if she can, if she can hear you right now, she'd probably say him too. Yeah. You know James, uh, thanks a lot. Where can people follow you and follow your travels? Maybe on Twitter? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter uh, at James Sabalski if you can spell it. Good luck. Uh, okay. You can find me on Instagram uh, awesome. at James underscore Sabalski as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's all I got right now. I think I, you know, I, I feel like I've kind of stayed off TikTok. I feel like I'm <laughs> not as active as I used to be on social media. And that yeah. seems to be from a mental health standpoint. That's okay. Good. Yeah. My, my kids don't allow me to go on TikTok or Snapchat because they think I would just bring embarrassment to the entire emo household yeah i feel like i need to learn a tiktok dance but at some point but yeah we'll see get it. one of your get one of your daughter. james thanks for your honesty your humility your trust transparency uh i know i appreciate you i know everyone watching will appreciate you and uh we look forward to connecting once how again so here come show <laughs> how do we do it we yeah go. let's see oh 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 yeah whoa okay who's this one that's uh that's my 10 year old real okay real is gonna have to teach me too james you're the best thanks for everything man all right, Clay. Peace out, buddy. Nice okay, to see you. Okay, take care.